we need to get together, we need to work together, we need to be challenged, and we need to basically figure out what this whole blockchain is doing and how we can use it to innovate the big companies and work together with the startups. And that's going to happen. Now, but what are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with this blockchain with all these different perspectives? And it all starts with one thing, with trust, and on the other side, identity. You know, blockchain is trust, but the only have what is going on with identity? How can we make sure that all these regulations, because she didn't get us from the hook, she didn't say, okay, everything is allowed. No, we want privacy, we want money laundering, we need to protect it to everything. All the normal rules apply to the blockchain. And how can we basically do business in a secure way and also deal with identity? And I'm happy to, very happy to report that that very issue, we have Mr. Identity Europe here in the room, David Birch, who's basically written all the books about it, and he's basically going to think about it, uh, and he's going to talk about it, how we're going to do that. So give him a big hand, the money fund speaker, David Birch. <laughs> Uh, right. Uh, is there a thing for the slides? Yes. Shall I give that to you? Did you have the? Oh, there we go. Thank you. Okay. Um, <coughs> yes. So what I'm going to talk about this morning is um, is much more specifically. So so last year this was a great event, uh, and I remember sort of talking at a very high level, uh, as as many people did. Um, and I thought this year it would be good to sort of focus down on more specific topics. And one of the most interesting topics, I think, is uh, identity. I was at Consensus in New York. Um, actually, I was going to say, was anybody else at Consensus? But I can't see anything because of the lights. I have, I have, literally, I have no idea if there's an audience left <laughs> in the room at all. So I won't... I won't say that, but the point is, I was at Consensus, and one of the key topics which kept coming up again and again was this issue of identity. Um, and in particular, uh, and, there, and there have been some subsequent conferences and discussions about whether you know, putting identity on the blockchain is a good thing or not, and how we're going to do it. And I ha anybody that follows me on Twitter will see I've got into some arguments with people about this recently over the last few weeks. Um, because the, the, you know, should we put identity on the blockchain has two, uh, there are two issues that need to be discussed within that. So one is uh, what is identity and the other one is what is a blockchain. So uh, once we've got those two things sorted out, then I think we can move the discussion forward. So, um, so I'm going to try and cover both of those today, which I think would be... And I should say, I'm, I am genuinely curious, because I know nobody knows the answer to, what, to, to how exactly we're going to do this. I, I am genuinely curious as to what you think about the model that I'm going to present, and I, and I genuinely welcome the feedback on it. Um, so, uh, so please post uh, on Twitter uh, what you think. So I'm going to do it in three parts. Um, I'm going to talk about a model of identity, and in particular a model of digital identity, because I think it, it's impossible to take the discussion forward unless everybody in the room has some shared understanding of what, of what I mean by identity. So I know your heart sinks, mine does, whenever the, present, whenever the presenter says, now what is identity? I know, I know what a horrible thing, but we can't have any discussion unless you understand what I mean by uh, identity. So we're going to have a little model of identity. Um, I'm going to talk about why some form of shared ledger for identity transactions might work, and I particularly want to frame the discussion in that context. Um, and then I'm going to I'm going to look at a practical example of how it might of how it might work. So those are my three areas to cover. Okay. So stage one is to have a model of digital identity, and the way I formed uh, this model. Uh, is based on a couple, of, a couple of ideas that actually go back quite a long way to some of the, the chapters in, in this book. And I just want to highlight three points uh, in order so that you understand where the thinking is coming from. So the, f the first thing is, and you'll have seen this from anything I've written about this, I, I am a very big fan of pseudonymity. 
So a pseudonymous transaction is a transaction where the counterparties may not know who each other is, but somebody knows who each other is, right? So to give the very simple example, uh, so uh, Connie looks me up on Ashley Madison, uh, and when she looks me up on Ashley Madison, um, the first thing she wants to know, it, well, the, I, I'm guessing, I don't know the first thing she wants to know. I'm, <laughs> this is for rhetorical purposes. The first, thing, <laughs> the first thing I think she should want to know is, am I a real person or not? Right? That's a very simple... Uh, do you have any idea how hard that question is to answer on the internet right now? Just that, is this a real person or not? Right? So let's imagine, so Connie wants proof that I'm a real person, so I send her something from uh, uh, Barclays or ABN or something like that which says that I'm a real person, and she knows who ABN are, and she can trust ABN. She doesn't know who I am, but she knows that somebody knows who I am. That's what I mean by pseudonymous. So my first principle is that online interaction should be pseudonymous. It's a fundamental, if we're going to have any kind of privacy or manageable existence in the online environment, uh, we must have pseudonymity. To any of those people who are talking about we must have internet driving licenses and whatever, they're absolutely insane. They don't know what they're talking about. The second point is that... Um, uh, these pseudonymous identities, which will be the virtual identities that we interact with in cyberspace, are very easy to link to digital identities, so we can have lots of them, depending on what a digital identity is, of course. So the idea that we interact online, but we interact online through lots of identities for specific purposes, is a very important part of my model. Um, and the third part is that we want people to have lots of these identities. Now... Um, so when I'm interacting with you, whether I choose my ABN identity or my football club identity or my hobby identity or my home identity or my family identity or whatever, I expect people to have a whole bunch of identities, just like they have a whole bunch of credit cards or debit cards right now. And it's an important thing. So we want to get away from the idea that you have an identity and somehow this identity has to be used in all circumstances uh, otherwise, we can't have any kind of legal certainty. That's just plain wrong. So these are sort of my basic principles. Now, in order to... In order to uh, sorry, I've just realised why it's called trolls. <laughs> so, so the argument against all this, people say, well, if you let people have pseudonymous virtual identities, then you have the problem of trolls, right? Because people are anonymous on the internet and they say horrible things to each other and all, all this kind of thing, right? And you have a terrible problem with trolls. And my point is, that's not true. That depends on how you implement things. So if you implement things properly with a secure infrastructure, there's no reason why people cannot interact pseudonymously and you don't have to have trolls and all this horrible stuff. I don't want to talk about that today. Okay, so, so here's the model that I'm going to use. And the reason the model looks like this is because my assumption that people will have lots of virtual identities, right? So on the left-hand side, you've got lots of virtual identities. And some of those identities are controlled by more than one uh, mundane, a real identity on the right-hand side, okay? And I'll give you a simple example would be the virtual identity of Consult Hyperion. The virtual identity of Consult Hyperion isn't controlled by one mundane identity. There are several executive officers of the company that can do things with that virtual identity. So there's no one-to-one -one mapping between virtual identities and mundane identities, right? So you have many virtual identities on one side and many mundane identities on the other side. And if you try to link those together, a very basic rule of systems analysis... I know, I know systems analysis isn't fashionable anymore. I know you're all agile and nobody bothers with requirement specifications anymore. No one tries to work out what they're supposed to be doing before that. I know all of this, OK? But when I was growing up, we used to do a thing called systems analysis. And in systems analysis, one of the iron rules of systems analysis was you can't have many-to-many -many entity relationships. If you have a many-to-many -many relationship, that means there's something in the middle that you hadn't thought about. And so this is in this instance, I want the many to many, I want many virtual identities, many mundane identities, the missing identity, uh, the missing entity in the middle, that's digital identity. So I'm very, when, when I say digital identity, I mean something very, very specific by digital identity. Okay. So in this model, 
you have a digital identity, which, it, I mean, you can think of it as being a key pair for sake of argument. So think of a digital identity as a key pair. This, this is the easy way to think about things. So in the middle, you have a digital identity, and you might have several people, several mundane identities that can control that digital identity, several people that have access to that private key. And on the other side, the public key can be used to create a great many virtual identities, or what you would think of as public key certificates, right? So on my right-hand side here, I've made two examples. I've got, uh, I've got my digital identity, uh, which is DGW Birch. And from that, there are two virtual identities created, one from the BBC and one from ANZ. And remember what I said about the creation of the virtual identities. So taking the public key from my digital identity and making a virtual identity from that, which is essentially by signing it with your own private key. So, so my BBC identity is my public key signed by the BBC's private key. And because of the way public key photography works, anybody in this room can check the BBC public key, and so therefore they can tell that that's a real virtual identity. That's an uh, inexpensive cryptographic operation. We can have lots of those. Now, uh, I don't want to go into it now, but one other point about this, of course, is those virtual identities contain, contain the same public key, so they can be matched. So that's why I don't think people will just have one of these, because you don't want, necessarily, your identity to be tracked across the multiple virtual identities. If I have a virtual identity that I use for financial services, right? so it has the same public key in the virtual identity from ANZ and Barclays and Credit Suisse, that might be absolutely fine. right? But there might be other circumstances where I don't want them to be tracked. I don't want them to be, to be matched across different virtual identities. So therefore, I would have a different digital identity, i.e. a different key pair. Now, um, in practical terms, those key pairs, which, which are the heart of all of this kind of thing, the ownership of the digital identity depends on the ownership of a private key. I'm sure you can all see where this argument is going. So the, uh, so. In it, to do anything with the digital identity, you have to control the private key. And this issue of control of the private keys is what comes back to or how are we actually going to really implement this kind of thing. So, um, oh, sorry. Now, um, I've divided the use of these identities across three domains, um, which is very, very familiar to anybody that works in the identity space. So we have an identification domain, Right? So identification. So in my world, identification means binding the private key to a mundane identity. Right? Identification means something really specific to me, not a general term. So in the identification domain, we need a way to connect, that pub, to connect the private key to something in the real world. That is complicated and expensive. Because that's you having to go to the bank with a passport and driving licenses and God knows what else. So we want, we want to minimize the number of interactions in the identification domain because identification domain complicated and expensive. And also, by the way, every time you're forced to reveal your real identity in, in the domain, that opens up the potential for identity theft if it's not done properly. So we want to minimize those interactions. In the middle, you have the authentication domain. So authentication means demonstrating that you have control of the private key. So I, again, I'm, I'm not using these words generically. I mean something very specific by authentication. Authentication means demonstrating that you have control of the private key. And then we have the authorization domain, which is where stuff gets done. Okay? So we transfer we transfer our, our interactions into this authorization domain, and that means all of the interactions are between virtual identities that are allowed to do stuff. So we don't have any more who are you questions in the authorization domain. We have the what can you do questions. Are you allowed to access this bank account? Can you open this door? Can you drive this car? We don't ask who are you. We get that out of the authorization domain. We don't want to use your identity in transactions wherever possible. So, so the first part of my model is we now have the real identity, the digital identity, the virtual identity, the three domains, and they mean something specific. I'm not using them as generic terms. So that's the, okay. So now we can move on to we can move on to what we're going to do with that. Okay. So I don't want to talk about. This. So in the identification domain, yeah, it's complicated and expensive. Authentication is getting easy because of mobile phones and FIDO and stuff like that. So that's nice and straightforward. And in the authorization domain, the switch to apps and mobile phones and online and whatever means these things are actually easy to implement. They really are. 
right? Because it's all to do with just moving these keys and certificates around. I don't want to spend time talking about that. OK, right. So given that we now have a model of, I mean, you don't have to agree with it, but just for the sake of argument, let's just go with it, right? So I now have a specific model of identity. So the next question is, what are our options for connecting that model of identity to some form of shared ledger? So uh, here's, uh, here's my shared ledger at the bottom, and here's my identities at the top. How are we going to connect those two things together? Well, the Next part of the model I want to put in front of you here is that the ledger, a ledger, is not a record of things. That would be like a database or something. A ledger is a record of transactions, right? So if we're going to store things in the ledger, what we need to store in the ledger are transactions. So what are the transactions that are associated with what identity that we're going to store in the ledger, right? So to, again, I want to get away from generic terms. Shared ledger is a record of transactions. So what are the identity transactions that we're going to store in the ledger? Well, and from the way I've set it up, you can see there are three kinds of identity that we could put in the ledger. So the first thing we could do is we could take the real identities and put them in the ledger. Okay? Sorry, CRUD means create, read, update, delete. So it just it doesn't mean nonsense. It means create, read, update, delete. So uh, I could take your real identity and I could put that in the blockchain. Okay, And this is the sort of nonsense that you read about quite a lot at the moment. We can give everybody in the world an identity because we can take their fingerprints, face, DNA, whatever, and put it on the blockchain for no conceivable reason that I could imagine. I can't think of any viable use case which would make sense to store people's actual identities on a blockchain somewhere. I mean, that just seems to me to be inviting trouble, right? We, what, we want to keep your real identity locked up, safe, away from all of this kind of thing. So the idea of taking your real identity and putting it on a shared ledger, a blockchain, or the blockchain, I, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure I can see any real reason for doing that, OK? When, when Connie and I connect up on Ashley Madison, she's not looking for my DNA, not at first, OK? All she's looking for is... So connecting to the real identity doesn't help, because it, it doesn't answer the important question, you know? But also, the other thing is, if you start putting things like DNA on blockchains, then you can start... So, so for example, I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago, and somebody from the uh, Department of Homeland Security was talking about DNA testing at points of entry, not for identification purposes, but familial matching, right? So if I turn up at a, an airport with a kid and I say, yeah, this is my son, nephew, whatever, they can uh, take cheap swabs and they can do DNA testing now. And it only takes two hours, which I think is pretty impressive. It takes two hours to get the familial match, like, are you related to this uh, kid? And, um, and so it would be fun. Like, if everyone's DNA was on the blockchain, you know, you could run these matches all the time to find out who was related to everybody else. And that might considerably increase the gaiety of the nation. That's all I'm saying. It might be, I don't think Neely would be very happy with it, but it, the point is it would be funny, wouldn't it? Because, you know, you fill out that form when you go to America, how many family members are traveling with you, you know? <laughs> and then you get to the desk and the guy says, guess again, you know? <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> So I'm not sure about putting real identities on the blockchain. It's a possibility, but I'm not sure about that. But what about putting digital identities on the blockchain? That's an interesting idea, because remember the key problem that I alluded to. If, if this is a good model of identity, if digital identity is essentially a key pair at its heart, then the problem of looking after that private key becomes the key digital identity problem, right? So, I create the digital identity DGW Birch. Do I really want the responsibility of looking after the private key? Right? Now, uh, at consensus, nobody liked my idea. But my idea was I can take my private key, I can convert it to a QR code, like you saw this morning, and then I can have it tattooed onto my scrotum. And I thought that would be a very effective way of managing the private key and making sure that it was you know, largely private, right? Um, but also so that I wouldn't forget it. Because, you know, 
if it's, if it's in something I can forget, then we've, this has got no future. Because if you can lose that private key, you absolutely will. Look what happened with Bitcoin, with all the people who, like, because they were worried about Bitcoin security. So they printed out their, their keys and they put them on pieces of paper and then the dog ate it. And that's your Bitcoin's gone, right? We don't want to be in that sort of world. So the problem of what to do with the private key is a serious problem, okay? And uh, I'm not sure that putting it on the blockchain solves the problem. Because if I put it on the blockchain, then the ownership of the private key that owns the private key becomes the problem. All I'm doing is moving that problem on one step. I'm not solving the problem in any way. As speaking as a member of the general public and not one of the blockchain Illuminati that are in front of me, speaking as a member of the general public, I don't want the responsibility of managing a private key. I don't. I want the private key to be managed by a regulated financial institution that I have legal recourse against if something goes wrong. I don't want the stress of looking after a private key. I want the bank or somebody else to do it for me, right? And have their own authentication mechanisms for me to access it. So putting the digital identity on the blockchain, that doesn't feel to me like it's solving a problem because I've still got the problem of looking after the other private key. So the third possibility would be, what if I took the virtual identities and put them on the blockchain? Now, that kind of makes more sense to me, right? So I've now got a virtual identity that comes from ANZ Bank, which says minimal things. I mean, it says, basically, it says I exist. I must have done, right? In order to have that virtual identity, I must have gone through KYC with ANZ, so I'm a real person. And I have a bank account. That's all it says about me. But for an awful lot of purposes, that's enough, right? So now I put that on the blockchain, OK? And when I'm on Ashley Madison, Connie says, prove that you're a real person. And I can point to an identity on the blockchain and say, that's me. I'm, look, see, I'm a real person, ANZ. And you know, that could solve some problems. I could see that could work. So if I take the identity transactions that are associated with that virtual identity, the creation, the read, the update, the delete of that virtual identity, and I put those on the blockchain, now I can see that we're getting somewhere. Okay? So now I come to open an account with ABN. ABN wants to know if I have an account with another bank. I point to my account with ANZ. They can just go and look at the blockchain. They don't have to talk to ANZ because the CRUD, the creation, the reading, the update, deleting of that, it, it's all on the blockchain. So now, if they want to see, for example, does that account still exist or has it been deleted, all they've got to do is look along the blockchain for that virtual identity and see if there's a delete record. So it kind of makes sense to take those identities and put them onto the blockchain, right? So we, have, we now have the bank looking after my private keys that are associated with the digital identity. We have another bank that's created a virtual identity that's linked to that. I've put that virtual identity onto the blockchain. But my real identity and my real digital identity, those are locked away and looked after and taken care of, right? You know, when I go and stay in a hotel, the first thing I do is I take my identity. I take my passport and my credit cards, and I lock those up in the hotel safe. And when I go out for dinner, I just take a prepaid card that doesn't have my name on it, right? I keep my identity locked up, and for transactional purposes, I use something else. And I think this takes us in that direction. OK, so for the final part of the presentation, <clears throat> I want to answer the so what question. So I can store my virtual identities. I can store the crud of my virtual identities on the blockchain. So what? I can store them in a database. I can store them in the bank. What are you guys going to do differently with this kind of identity? that we couldn't do using other technology? And my answer is this, right? If you look at my model of the shared ledger, I divide the shared ledger into two parts. We have the communications, the content consensus that we talked about last year. And on top of that, we have the appallingly badly mislabeled contract layer, right? I hate the word contract. They're not contracts. If they were called someone else, we'd never have got into this mess with Ethereum and the DAO. They're not contracts and they're not smart. Contracts is a stupid word for distributed applications. But I've kept it because it begins with C. And so it's easy. <laughs> it's easier for everybody to remember the model if they all begin with C, if you understand what I'm pointing. Now, my point is, 
there's a break between the bottom layers and that top layer, which I call the Bouvier-Sams boundary. So the bottom layer is about the shared ledger, but the top layer is about the applications we're going to run on the shared ledger. The bottom three layers are about this new kind of computer that we've created, the consensus computer that we've built using these proof-of-work protocols or other consensus protocols, other ways of managing practical Byzantine fault tolerance. What we've effectively built is a new kind of computer, the consensus computer. And on that new kind of computer, we can run a new kind of application, the shared ledger application. Now, my point is that if we're going to do something really new and really different in this space, we're going to do it through those applications. Those applications are the new way of doing stuff. What does that mean for my model? Well, I'll give you the example. Uh, here's how I'm going to implement my shared ledger. So I've got a shared ledger of identity transactions. So those entries are the CRUD that go with the virtual identities, the creation, update, read, and delete of the virtual identities. We're actually going to implement that in a real way. We could implement it in lots of different ways. I'm going to implement it in a blockchain, because that's what the conference is about. So I map my entries up here down to entries in a real blockchain. This is exactly how the block stream identity layer works. This is a very good way of doing it. In other words, you build applications that use the shared ledger for identity, the virtual one, and then you have different implementation choices about how you want to put it onto real uh, shared ledger technologies or blockchains. And so here's my point. So when you actually do the create, the C, when you create one of these virtual identities and you put it onto that shared ledger, you're really creating two things. You're creating the ledger entry itself, which contains that virtual identity or an encrypted version of that virtual identity. And you're creating the smart contract entry that goes with it. Okay? And so my suggestion to you, the model I want to leave you with, is what if we built, I'm going to use the example of KYC, what if we built our identity interactions on the basis of this, right, not the identities themselves? So in other words, if Connie wants to know whether I'm over 18, what really happens under the hood, it may not look like this in her mobile app, but under the hood, her smart contract is sending a transaction to my smart contract, and my smart contract is responding appropriately, right? So there are certain questions that my smart contract will accept. Are you over 18 is one of them. And it will respond back to Connie with a yes or no. And the shared ledger can have access to on-ledger data, the virtual identity itself, which might be an encrypted form. Or it can have access to off-ledger databases, which the smart contract knows about and can have access to, but are not themselves present on the blockchain. So here's the point of the model. What we're, putting on the, uh, what we're putting on the ledger is the crud of the virtual identities, and the way we access them is through the appallingly misnamed smart contracts. OK, right. So I want to finish with a practical example. Oh, I haven't got any time for a practical example. <laughs> I shouldn't have put that picture in, really. That's, that's a real picture. I like using this picture in security uh, talks. That's because I had a meeting at a bank, and, it, and, it, and it's a real picture. This is a meeting at a bank, and it happened to be on the same day that there was like a G20 or G8 or G6 or G9 or something. And, and there were protesters out in the streets protesting about things in general. I don't know what specifically. But they, they were protesting about it. It was something to do with G. And so the bank sent us an email to say, please don't come to the meeting today wearing a suit because it will inflame the protesters, <laughs> right? Which you could understand. I mean, I look pretty good in a suit. You've got to. <laughs> If I was a protester, I'd be inflamed by this, wouldn't you? It's a Ralph Lauren. Of course you'd be, inf of course you'd be upset by it. So, uh, so I thought, well, um, the way to not inflame the protesters then would be to go dressed as a protester. I thought this would be the most sympathetic thing I could do. So I went dressed completely in black from head to toe. I was wearing black gloves, dark glasses, black... I went completely in black from head to toe, and I walked into the bank and said, oh, I've got a 10 o'clock with whoever. <laughs> And they let me in. Look, there's, uh, there's the visitor's pass. They gave me the say. So my, my point is, the reason that that's not the security that we want. <laughs>
Like, that's not real security. That's pretending at security. I, you know, I signed the visitor's book. I could be anybody. I'm dressed as a protester for fucks. It's because it's we're English. If you say, if you politely ask to let, it doesn't matter if you're dressed as a terrorist. If you're polite, people will let you in. That's the English, <laughs> that's the English way. We don't want that security. We want real security, right? We don't want you no know, looking at driving licenses or whatever. We want some real security. And my suggestion to you is it's plausible at least that the shared ledger will imp oh sorry, that the shared ledger will implement that real security. And if we think carefully about the identity model and the way that we implement that using the shared ledger, we can have real security and real privacy. It's an attainable goal if we're smart. Thank you very much for listening. Dave. 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 Um, did I understand that you really still see a role of financial institutions and banks and help you to uh, help us to have all this merit of, of identity uh, levels to, to, to handle those? I, I think in the future, a bank will be a place where you store your identity, not your money. And the money will just be... You can in... store money anywhere. Money's not important, but your identity is important. That's why you want to store it in the bank. David Birch, thank you. <laughs>